Welcome to a special edition of the Cross Border Interviews for Canada Day 2024. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Tofino Mayor Dan Law. Just far enough from the nearest city, the everyday looks different in Tofino. Sunrise beach walks, a bike ride around town, seafood harvests steps away, and a surf check with a coffee in hand. Simple pleasures come easily here in Tofino. So stick with us, and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross border interviews featuring Tofino Mayor Dan Law. Are you looking for a team of experienced professionals to help develop a strategic plan for your municipality? Look no further. At Strategic Steps, their team of experts has years of experience working in municipal administration. They take a comprehensive approach to planning, carefully listening to your community's needs, and working closely with your council to develop a homegrown strategy tailored to your unique community. Contact Strategic Steps today to learn more about how they can help you create a brighter future for your community. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Mayor Law, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona of mayor for a few minutes, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Dan? Well, I, uh, you know, I've been working with uh, with community organizations for for most of my adult life. Uh, my wife and I are very, uh, you know, very connected with uh, working with children and youth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so really, it's just a continuation of of what I'd already been doing. Um, but uh, you know, I, I decided that uh, you know, as you get older, uh, it's it's time to move out of the way for the younger crew to to take over that kind of hands on uh, hands on service to the community. And and I really wanted to get into into sort of policy making, and more moving the whole community in a certain direction, uh, which I felt uh, you know more reflected what the community wanted at the time. So you first get elected through a by election in twenty twenty one when the former mayor steps down to become uh, no did I get this wrong? Oh no sorry sorry yeah yeah no I uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to do a by election uh, for a councilor. Oh then, okay. Uh, from there quickly moved uh, into a by-election for mayor uh, because our mayor, uh, you know, we had a great mayor, Josie Osborne, moved on to be uh, to be our MLA and then minister. So so it was two by-elections in a row. Okay. So I that's the great thing about this. I tried to do some research, but it's always great to learn <laughs> about the people from the people. So I want to ask, prior to that first elect by-election where you ran for councillor, had you considered a municipal politics being the role that you'd want to give back in through that policy making through that hands-on experience that you talked about in your earlier uh, statement yeah no i did i did uh, absolutely i was thinking about it uh the, the thing that happened is that uh, we'd had uh, four children before and they were getting old and then uh, uh we were all of a sudden having another uh another kid uh, late in the game and uh you know i i just thought you know there's absolutely no way that i could enter into politics at this time it'll be too crazy and so uh you know my wife and i talked about it and wally and i and when we i stepped out and didn't go for the election and then immediately i just felt uh i felt really sad you know i was like no I, you know i missed the chance uh, i should have done that even though i it would have been hard and uh and you know, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, maybe there's going to be a by-election, and 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 that's what happened. Uh, there, you know, uh, a friend of mine who was a councillor for a long, long time in Tofino, very very uh, influential uh, councillor, she she actually passed away. So we had a by-election, and I ran for that spot, and I did win, uh, and then uh, within a very short period of time, uh, there was another by-election for mayor. What was it about the municipal draw? Policy can come at different levels. You could have chosen the provincial route. You could have chosen the federal route. But at the end of the day, you chose municipal. And that's what the show is all about, is about getting to know why people choose the municipal route. What was it about municipal politics that drove you and said, okay, the best way to make an impact on my community is at the council table in my community? 
you know, Tiffy, you know, I, I really like my community. I, I like what was going on. I was uh, invested in the families and children and youth here and the community as a whole. And uh, and I really saw that as uh, as tourism was booming, the economy, the economy was doing great. Uh, it seemed to me that the some of the community amenities, certainly recreation for children and, and the educational opportunities for children was was declining. And so, you know, in the in the couple decades that I've been here, I noticed that the, the children had less and less to do, uh, you know, and there was there was less service to them. And so I, I, I thought, you know, it, it, there was a growing discontent with with tourism. And I saw that as as uh, as being because there there wasn't a direct route back to benefiting the community. And so and so I looked at who was on the roster. I looked at the general trend of the of the councils and i thought you know what if if i don't go in here and and try to make uh make some you know significant significant contributions then then this trajectory is going to continue and and families are going to continue to leave and and you know the, the children and youth are going to be continually disenfranchised and i wanted to change that now after four years in office few years as councillor and now as mayor do you feel like you've sort of changed that attitude or is it an uphill battle because government doesn't move at, at a quick pace from what i hear but for you have you been able to make that change for people in your community uh, absolutely yeah it's been remarkable it is uh it's been i gotta say in the four years that i've been in politics uh, we have a great council uh, we've got uh, we had an organizational restructure that was specifically as a result of looking at the deficits in the in the organization, the demographics that weren't being uh, being cared for, essentially, in my opinion, as well as they could have been. And uh, and so we just we just went through the whole thing. And it's been a it's been a fantastic change, to be honest. Uh, we, we've um, I, I would say it's almost a 180. Uh, and it's it, it's just because of. You know, the, the community was at a point where they elected people that were going to make some changes and those changes happened. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of collaboration uh, and uh, and some determination. And, you know, th th those things work. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, I could list off all the things that we've been able to accomplish, but... Um, Which we're going to talk about in a few seconds, but I want yeah, to ask a point. Yeah. I want to talk about a poignant question, though, because... At the end of the day, I, I'm, I, I would put dollar to dime to say you have come to the realization that your decisions that you make at that council table will impact people the day after you make them. And that means that sometimes you are going to have to make some very tough choices for your community. How do you, as mayor, and knowing that you're only one vote on council, how do you make those tough choices, understanding that the impact that you're going to decide on is going to impact people in your community potentially positively or negatively as well yeah you know we've been pretty lucky over the four years is that most of the of the challenges to to get to where we want to go have been very positive and and you know the majority of people are very supportive and even those that you know may grumble about costs or or this and that they they know that this is the right thing for the community because they experienced uh, they experienced the deficits and and they recognize the deficits. Now, we, recently, of course, we we've you know we've had to make some very difficult decisions around short term rentals. Uh, that's probably the biggest, uh, the most difficult decision that that I've had to to work through, and certainly councils had to work through in, in four years. And and that's because it it really does, you know, the decisions we make really do affect certain people very significantly. And and those are really difficult decisions. And basically, you know, what we come down to is is to do the research, get the data, really understand what is going on, and then put it through a, a municipal or government policy ethics lens. And so don't, you know, not just willy nilly firing off, this is what we're going to do, or, you know, that's what we're going to do and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, you know, I take it very, very seriously and, and, uh, and did the research, did the reading uh, and looked at, uh, looked at this decision, you know, particularly this decision uh, through a, a, a ethics policy lens. 
when you make those tough decisions? Is it important for you and your council as a whole to talk to the people who will disagree with you? Because you can make those tough decisions unless you sell it to the people who may disagree with you. You're never going to move collectively as a whole forward. So for you, is it important once you've made that decision to go sell it in some sense, sell it to the people, those who are for and those who are against your decision? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that, that's a good point. Uh, you know, communication is key uh, to any any decisions we make. The, you know, that particular one was rather difficult. I think in this case, we kind of let the, let the temperature drop a bit before we start to explore, you know, what you know, what it really means and how it's looking. I think the point is, is is that. You know, we all have to face hard decisions and not making a decision has an effect, right? There, There is no static. Everything is dynamic. Like house prices are dynamic. The cost of living is dynamic. The, uh, you know, uh, how tourism is is working in this month is dynamic. You know what I mean? So, so like the pandemic was dynamic. People had to deal with what was in front of them and to not make a decision, you know, could result or would result in, in, in an effect. And so that's the other the thing that you know our council was very aware of is yeah it's a difficult decision but not making a decision is a decision and it will have an effect and uh, and when deal when you're dealing with uh, you know a housing crisis uh, the, the skyrocketing costs of of housing uh, you know beyond what anybody with a job can ever afford it, it became clear that to not make a difficult decision would be would be uh, making a decision that would been would ultimately uh, put our community at risk. In my conversations with municipal leaders across Canada, I often get a sense that there's a there's become an apathetic nature around what goes on at City Hall, unless there's something controversial or something very hot topic like short term housing rentals. The average resident, I hate to say average resident because there's no such thing as an average resident, the, the residents of each individual community truly have tuned out of what's going on at City Hall. They probably wouldn't be able to tell me what the average or the what the what what's on the agenda package for that week or what council is debating. In Tofino, do you get a sense that people sort of use the old moniker of as long as my water's turned on and my garbage is picked up and the snow is cleared when it snows, I'm content on what's going on at City Hall. And that's why we've elected the mayor and council. Or do you get a sense that people are engaged and want to give you their feedback on certain items that are in front of council? You know, yes and no. Uh, people are very invested in, in, in what council's doing. Tofino has a very strong, uh, often very vocal community. And it's a very tight knit community. So I, I got to say, first of all, that that even when people are disagreeing, hotly disagreeing with council, uh, they're very civil. It's you know, which is great. Uh, you know, it's a mark of pride. It, uh, you know, people can be very upset, uh, but they generally, you know, we're all neighbors and and friends essentially. So so even in disagreement, uh, it, 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 they keep it civil. But lots of people are invested, mo mostly when the decisions affect them personally. And, uh, and in a small community like Tofino, decisions can affect a lot of people personally. And so, so we get different groups coming with being very vocal. So for instance, we have pickleball. We have a, pick we have a great pickleball crew and they're very vocal about their pickleball court. And, and it just opened today. So they're very, very happy. <laughs> Who wouldn't uh, be? Uh, pickleball is a great sport. That's what I've heard. I've never played it, but I've only heard. I played it today. Pickleball. <laughs> it's fantastic. Or you know, like we had, um, you know, we had uh, we we successfully lobbied the province, and then they they gave us a giant daycare. It's going to open in September. It was fantastic, but they put it right where you know they encroached on the only ball fields in Tofino, which were at the school, and so that was a big outcry from our from our our ball players. Uh, because uh, we, we don't have a lot of recreation amenities and, and we basically we don't have a municipal field. We don't have municipal ball fields. So we rely on the school. And so that became a, a challenge. OK, how are we going to completely change our relationship with our community school? How are we going to create a a model where we are going to invest as a community in saving those ball fields, making them better? And we got that out to the community. The community rallied, uh, and now you know 
the, the tenders have gone out and, and we're going to be having fantastic new district funded community school ball fields, washrooms. And so that was because people were very vocal. They're invested. You know, I can, I drop my kid off at school. I can see the ball fields and I can say, we are going to do that. And as long as we do that, as long as we listen to the people, you know, that are reasonable, Hey, this is a reasonable ask. You know, our town does not have the recreation amenities that many towns have. This is a reasonable ask. We have some money, uh, you know, through capital infrastructure levy or, or tourism dollars through our RMI program, uh, which is fantastic. And we can do this and everybody can win. And so that's what happens. And, and as long as we keep doing that, our, our town's happy <laughs> for but the most part. To play devil's advocate, you can't always say yes to people because you only have a limited supply of money to put into your community every year. You can't run deficits. So therefore, someone is going to come to you and say their unique issue, which is very important to them, needs to be fixed. But you as mayor and council have to look at it and go, it doesn't fit into our capital project list. It doesn't fit into our expansion of our community. Maybe we can do it in 20 years time. But right now, we have so much already on the go. Is it hard to balance the needs of the individual against the needs of the community, to quote Spock from Rathacon here? You know, you know I, that is a common uh, problem. It's a common issue. But I, I personally feel that our community is, is fairly well aware of all the demographics and and certainly I'm aware of the demographics and I go right back to stats can I go right back to the census I go back to the school I ask for data from the school and so so it gives me a very solid grounding on who in our community is being served well and who is not being served well and so I'm able to with my council make a strategic plan that will address those deficits to make everybody, you know, that's not being served uh, to the best uh, they can be to up to that level so that everybody's it's fair. Right. And as long as you do that, I, I think that as long as our council keeps doing that staff are very aware of this, as long as we're clear and fair, sometimes people don't get what they want, but they can understand that, that, yeah, there are other people that need something more. There's a, there's another area of our community that that needs to be addressed, and we're always balancing that. It's 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 like juggling. You know, always have to look at things through an ethics lens, uh, and you know, who, who gets the money, uh, who gets what. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, I want to turn to my next segment. And before I ask this first question, I want to preface it by asking, stating this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. It may match up with what council is talking about, but he is one person on that and he has one vote. So with that being said, for those who are about to send me emails, please don't because I preface it and I usually get emails no matter what in your opinion mayor law what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing tofino today as of recording this interview we have a series of, of challenges of course and I'm going to list them all off uh, as I've, I've already noted uh, you know community amenities we don't have a high school our kids bus to to include it for high school that that's vastly improved though so just just a caveat on that, uh, we we have few recreation amenities, as I've already noticed. Uh, we don't have a gym. Uh, you know, we're we're one of only uh, less than a handful of of municipalities of our size in BC that that don't have access to a public pool. So even though we're, you know, we're Canada's surf destination, it's very difficult for children and youth here to learn how to swim, which, which is uh, tragically ironic. But those are some, uh, you know, those are some issues. We also have the issue of infrastructure. We we are draw our water from Mears Island, which is a Tloquit tribal park. And we are essentially overdrawn for our maximum daily use. Uh, and, and so what happens is now is that we are in the process of developing a limits to growth policy. And that is a very important document in the next year, years, uh, as we deal with this uh, essentially max daily use water deficit in the summer, what do we do because we need housing? We need our economy to to keep to keep moving along. We need 
to develop housing with local First Nation. They've been waiting decades for land transfers. They are finally in, you know, getting those land transfers within the municipality. We want to prioritize uh, you know, them getting housing and, and also uh, can, you know, participating more in the tourism sector in Tofino. So those are all priorities of council. We need water essentially is we need more water and uh and that is a very very big ask and so uh you know basically what's going to happen over the next you know five years is that we are going to be you're going to be lobbying very very hard to to get another water source and it's going to be you know, it's going to be a, a very expensive and we're going to need a lot of partners both the federal and provincial government um and so that's going to be our biggest challenge uh you know the so other can challenge I, can, of I, can is, i jump is, in on there for a second because sure. I want to ask the chicken and the egg story because you talk about infrastructure. Infrastructure also includes water. Let's hypothetically put them in the same boat here for a second. You can't build housing without the infrastructure in place because developers won't come to your community and build unless there's already infrastructure. You're looking at changing the, I don't want to say looking at changing, but you're looking at bringing in more housing. You want to grow your community so people can live there and live like buy housing there. But you need to potentially add more water to your community, which would mean more infrastructure. How do you balance the needs of the community, the infrastructure community, with the needs of growing your community at the same time? Because you cannot do it just on the backs of the people who were there, because the people who were there might be struggling right now. And let's be honest, there's a big economic downturn in this country. And they're saying, we're tapped out. We can't give you more, but to grow your community, you need to give more. <laughs> That's, you know, that's the $100 million question. That, that is the question. And, uh, you know, I like do you to think, think you, of... Do you think Tofino struck, struck a balance between that? Well, we, we uh, you know, in our limits to growth policy, we're still, as we search out a secondary water source, like a new water source, we're also looking at ways of making our existing water use more efficient uh, in many, many ways. And we're looking at creative and novel ways to add housing that is very low water use. So we're looking at infill housing where, you know, I know staff are, are looking at policies that, that um, you know, make it clear how rainwater catchment can work. And so, uh, you know, so if, if, you know, there's options to optimize our existing water so that we can do some limited housing. Uh, again, you know, we're going to have to prioritize. We're going to have to do affordable housing. We have a Tofino Housing Corporation that, that uh, is very successful and, and we're opening apartments right now and, and we should be housing, uh, you know, uh, a couple hundred people in those. In those. So, so, so we have the tools to build affordable housing. Uh, we have a very invested provincial government who wants to build affordable housing. We have a provincial government who wants municipalities to work with First Nations, which we absolutely do want to do. So there's lots of, uh, you know, there's lots of intent. So getting all that aligned up and then and then making sure that the community knows what what we're at, where we're going. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy. But in the end, it will be successful uh, on multiple levels. I hate to ask the fortune teller question, but do you have an idea of when this could potentially come to fruition? Are you thinking like <laughs> next five years, next 10 years, tomorrow? Like, because if you become stagnant, developers aren't going to want to come and potentially build houses because they're looking at you and going, well, Tofino's just stuck in its ways and we're going to go look for somewhere else. Do you get a sense that developers want to build in your community? They're just waiting for the municipality or the province and or even the federal government or the First Nations to come to the table and work together to address these issues at a four-lateral sort of solution? Yeah, absolutely. Developers want to develop. We have a long list of developers. And, uh, you know, as long as I've been in, in politics, uh, that has been focused on housing. And so there hasn't been any resorts developed. There's been no you know, commercial rezoning for resorts or accommodations. It's all been housing. And we have a long list of developers who are in the queue who, who have uh, made it through zoning or almost through all their zonings or rezoning process and they're they're waiting to build. Now there's other factors at play. Of course, you know, the inflation rate is ridiculous. The cost <laughs> of building in Tofino is astronomically high. And so all of those developers have to make money. 
right? You can't expect a developer to come and make, you know, build housing for free. They've got to make, they've got to make a profit. And we totally understand that. And that profit is harder and harder to make right now. And so what we're doing in many, many different ways is we're, you know, we're pitching it to the province. Hey, how can we get these developers to build housing? Uh, maybe you can kick in some cash to get them over that line, uh, whether it's working through the Tofino you know, Housing Corporation or whatever it is, CMHC, BC Housing, to get them over the line and, and get those costs just reduced enough that they can still make a profit, still develop housing. Except that, you know, on, on top of that, we have to deal with water. So so that's the new curveball. And that's, uh, you know, that's a very recent curveball that, that we have to deal with as well. Uh, you know, we could have some fantastic housing developments in queue and we can say hey you know what we just don't have the water to turn it on uh, so you don't get your building permit we've mm -hmm. also got latent development rights we got you know people resorts that have the right to build based on their zoning but we don't have the water and so we you know we're at the process where we're, we're turning those down and saying you know we're, we can't give you a building permit because we do not have the water and it would put our community at high risk now, I'm going to ask the stupid question right now here, Dan, the uh, mayor, law, I apologize. And it's oh, going Dan, to sound it's very, very stupid, but I need to ask it. You are surrounded by water, are you not? Tofino is literally on the water <laughs> and you're talking. About, and I know this might sound like a stupid question, but what is what is the holdup? Because you do have lakes that you can uh, get water from, but it seems like. It's not happening. Well, circle the peg. Circle the peg for me here, Mayor. Well, you know, to quote Steinbeck, uh, you know, water, water everywhere. An area drop to drink, and it's salt water, and you can't drink salt water for very long before you, uh, you know, end up in the hospital. You, you know that that's a. We have water sources. They're far fresh water sources. They're far away. As uh, so, you know, the Kennedy Lake is is uh, you know thirty odd kilometers away through a national park reserve. Uh, through traditional Tlokot and a house of territory, there's water sources. Uh, you know, salt water comes up and, and desalination is often discussed. And we do have some developers who can say, hey, you know, we want to develop. What if we desalinate ourselves? How does that work? Right? If, you know, other places do it. But, you know, it's like everything in politics is so easy to solve over a cup of coffee and then when you get actually into it, it becomes very, very difficult because things are actually difficult. If they weren't difficult, they would be solved. You know, like, so, you know, one of the things is what do you do with the brine? It's very, uh, you know, it's toxic. You've got to have permits to get rid of it. Where do you get rid of it? Uh, you can't run a desalinator part time. You have to run it full time. So you can't just run it in the summer. As far as I understand, it has to run year round. Uh, what are the policies in place? How do you hook up? a private source of water with district water. You can't mix the two. You know, the federal government is not going to allow us to do that uh, for good reason, because uh, basically we're allowing another entity to connect their water source that we have no control over with everybody else's water source. And you can see that that is just not, a it is, you just can't do that. And so there's lots going on uh, in the background that has to be, to be worked through. And sometimes uh, it's more difficult and people just walk away. They say, well, we're not going to do that. It's, we thought it was easy, but it's not. Everything was easy would be a better off country, if you ask me. <laughs> Everything's easy, just add money. <laughs> exactly, which no one has in 2024, it seems like. Um, I want yeah, to and we're, you know, and people are tapped out. People are, you know, the mortgages come through, they're paying thousands of dollars more a month. You know, it's it's tough times. Do you, do you get a sense that you have to look at your budget every year? And I'm sort of throwing you back to the original segment, but you play a role in that as well as a municipality. Is it hard to reduce service levels or ask people to pay a little bit more when you're trying to grow your community, but at the same time, not do it in a way that is going to affect people's pocketbook because a lot of mortgages were just up for renewal. And I can tell you ours was, and we got hit with a big increase and I was not too happy with that, but I can imagine every other place in this country is in the exact same boat that I'm in. So do you find that you have to look and be more more I, I don't even know what the word i want to try to use here do you feel like you have to actually look at your budget a lot harder than traditionally the provincial or the federal government because the people you your tax bill gets sent out 
and they're going to tell you at the grocery store that your tax notice yeah. has just made me potentially live paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, Tofino is, uh, I mean, people love to complain about taxes. That's one thing you learn about. <laughs> Two things you learn when you get into municipal politics. A, uh, what everything actually costs, because nobody <laughs> knows until they really enter into, but like I look around and I tell people often, it's like everything you see costs money and somebody's paying, right? Everything, the roads, they're like, you know, we put in pay parking as an example of, of one way to both control parking because it was out of, out of control. We didn't have any parking, uh, you know, uh, 750,000 people visit Tofino. We have 2,500 people living here on a very small peninsula. Parking was difficult. So we brought in pay parking and that basically uh, it, 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 it fixed our parking problem because nobody likes to pay. And so they they move around a lot or they don't drive. You know, they stay at their hotel and don't drive. And it brings in revenue. And we use that revenue for, for things like recreation, uh, to pay for the parking infrastructure, to pay for roads, et cetera, sidewalks. And, and so that was one way that we can say to the community, hey, look, it's expensive to live here. Uh, sure, taxes are significant. But look, we're finding ways to to get people that use who use that piece of infrastructure, in this case, parking, to pay for it, or at least pay a bit more uh, than they were, you know. So, so there's lots of ways that uh, municipalities can try to offset taxes. Now, people love to complain about taxes, uh, property taxes, and certainly the you know some properties in Tofino, a waterfront property, several acres with a couple homes, those properties have skyrocketed in value, and their property taxes are are high. You know, some people are paying seven to twelve thousand dollars a year but in the grand scheme of of what it costs to live like a median value home in tofino the mortgage on a median value home in tofino is is far far in excess per month of what you'd pay in an annual property tax uh you know it's what you know one our, our median value homes are about 1.5 million dollars right now and so you can imagine what uh, what that costs to service a mortgage. And so so taxes are actually fairly small. I mean, you're looking at essentially for a one point five million dollar home, you look at five hundred bucks a month, really, in taxes. And you get like what you get for it. You get you get schools, you get hospitals, you get policing, you get roads, you get bylaw, you get business licensing, all of those things. You know, parking at the beach, washrooms, garbage cans, like. Everything you see costs money. That's a pretty good return. 500 bucks a month to get all that, you know, uh, that's a pretty big deal. You know, if the water main breaks outside on Christmas Eve at midnight, there is a crew knee deep in there fixing it. And you don't have to pay for it. You know, it's already been paid for. And so so I look at more of it as an investment. So, But that's a hard sell to people because, they, you know, they loved complaining about taxes. And sometimes taxes are, are pretty high. But in the grand scheme of things, I think tax, municipal taxes are mostly extremely reasonable compared to what you pay for everything else. I mean, some people pay more for cell phones and entertainment than they pay for the taxes. I, I want to flip the script a little bit. And I want to move off of challenges and talk about accomplishments. Now, I understand that every municipality in this country has their fair shares of challenges. But... Every municipality also has their thing that they're most proud of. As the mayor of Tofino, what's the thing that you boast about when it comes to your community? What's the thing that you look at? And let's let's take it from a governmental administration side. What's the thing that you, when you go to UBCM, when you go to FCM, that you go, you know what? You've got your, you, you, you're doing it okay. Tofino's doing it better. What's that accomplishment <laughs> that you're proud of? <laughs> well, you know, there, that's, uh, that's, that's a big question. And it's there's not one answer. So I, how about if I rattle off a bunch of answers? You can rattle off as much as you want. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, uh, back in the 80s, the, the very first government grant, tourism government grant for the, uh, for the district was for water. And the district and the area C or area by the beaches had to amalgamate. And that was to start to pursue tourism as an economy. Today, we have 2,500 residents, full-time residents. We have 750,000 visitors a year, we, which is 300 to one, which is, which is higher than any other uh, resort community in, in BC. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's probably one of the highest in, in the nation. And we're still a beautiful, tight community. We protect 
uh, you know, we protect the beaches. We we are very invested in in protecting the environment. We're very invested in working with local First Nation and housing First Nation. Uh, so we've maintained, even though we're like it, by all intents and purposes, we're we're very successful economically. We still are a great local little community, and that is an amazing accomplishment. And uh, people that, that want to be here, be here. Be, are here because they like the town. They want to be here. They love the area. They love the beaches. They love the trees. They take a hit to be here. Everybody that lives in Tofino takes a hit. What uh, it's that? a bit. It's a. What's that? What do you mean by taking a hit? Do you mean just because of the amenities that are so far away? Like you're not a stone's throw away from Victoria or Colwood or even Saanich. You are. Uh, you have to drive a little bit to get sort of the amenities of a large town. Yeah, we're we're far away. We're remote. It's uh, you know the weather in the, in the winter can be very rainy and stormy. Uh, you know it's 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 a tough place to live at times because of all of those things: the remoteness, the wildness, the ruggedness. Uh, you know, it uh, you, you have to take somewhat of a hit to to be here, uh, which is great. And but we're such a good community. I mean, we're such a fantastic community. We, we've just accomplished working with the uh, school district for a memorandum of understanding, and we can now collaborate and uh, and work together, partner on on all of those amenities. We we work very closely with Island Health uh, to you know, on housing and a new hospital, and you know we're going to get a, a sobering assessment center. So that was a lot of work. Uh, we work with ACRD. We've got Bear Smart. So, you know, there's so many cool things that uh, that this town has accomplished. We have Tofino you know, Housing Corporation again. I know it's you know one of the very few communities in, in BC that has their own housing corporation. We've been very successful. We got over twenty million dollars from from both levels of government above us, and uh, we're going to be housing hundreds of people, which has transformed our community already. And that took years of of dedication from many councils in a row and individuals and organizations and societies to 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 get that to get that far uh you know i could go on there's so many Can one I... of the one of the best things that, that ever happened at Tofino. here's a great one i know you probably want to jump in no go okay. ahead because i want to ask you about an important topic before uh, we turn to my last segment so go ahead okay one of the things that we've uh, that we had years ago uh, when I first got here, you know, there was uh, no way to get into town. You had to walk on the road, believe it or not. Right. So, uh, I remember, you know, we're pushing our little kids on the road to get downtown. And now we have a multi-use path. That's, uh, that's absolutely fantastic all the way out through the community. Now it goes all the way through the national park, all the way through the And so we are now connected by a multi-use path for cycling, pedestrians, skateboards, you name it, if it has wheels, uh, e-bikes. And it is an absolute jewel of our community. We could not host 750,000 people without a multi-use path. And that was directly paid for in the original uh, iteration. Uh, it was paid for by community members who, who basically had you know, community suppers. And they raised enough money to start paving it. Wow. But now it's paid through tourism dollars. So the, you know, we're able to build that road, ma maintain it and 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 widen it and make it better and improve it through tourism dollars. It's a direct result of investing uh, 40 years of investing in tourism and growing that economy. This episode is airing on Canada Day, and I wouldn't be, I would be remiss if I didn't ask the question about your relationship with your surrounding First Nations uh, communities around Tofino. Has that been a priority for you to foster a working relationship with the First Nations community around Tofino? And what would you say is the benefit of working alongside your First Nations communities? Yeah, it's it's absolutely a priority, and uh, we are in the you know Tofino itself is in the traditional territory of the Kolkwit people, uh, and uh, we recognize that, and and we do honor the Kolkwit First Nation, uh, the Hausa people. I personally have worked with uh, First Nations communities in First Nation communities for for decades, and uh, so you know it, it's it's a personal, it's a it's a community endeavor, it's a council endeavor, and certainly a personal endeavor to to bring equity and and reconciliation in a very real sense not just the word 
reconciliation? What does it mean? And so we we actively work with the local First Nation on their endeavors, what they would like to see, what they want, and uh, and we we work with them and and we let them know what we need as well. You know, like say, hey, here's here's what we're working on. Here's what we need. Uh, will you will you write a letter in support? And they do, and and we say, hey, what do you want? And we're going to be behind you 100 percent. And, uh, and we're going to work together because we all we all have to live here. You know, we're we're, we're one area and uh, nobody's going anywhere. And uh, we've got a lot of historical wrongs that have to be righted. And it, it's wonderful to be part of a country where self-reflection and uh, correction, self-correction is part of our identity. Do you know what I mean? That That is an absolute gift. Uh, to say, hey, you know what? We're going to work together. We're going to make it work. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's a saying in, in Uchalmuth, uh I'm probably going to get it wrong, but, um, you know, all things are one. Uh, I won't bother saying it in Uchalmuth because I know I'll mess it up, but Hashuk uh, Ish <laughs> Sawak, I think is what it is, but uh, all things are one, and that's what we have to realize. And so our, our council is very, very aware of that. We're, we're embracing uh, embracing that. And, you know, the BC government, we're essentially also, we're, we're creatures of the government. And the BC government has has implemented a DRIPA. And, and so we are going to do that, and we're going to be successful. I appreciate that answer. Um, I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time and we've already touched on it a little bit, but I want to dive into it a little bit further. I think tourism is a, a facet that a lot of municipalities don't go into a lot because it's just not on their radar. But Dofino seems to be like have literally gone all in on tourism because you are a tourism community. But Let's talk about the hidden gems. What are the hidden gems of your community that you say, you know what, everyone knows about the beachfront, the downtown core, but what are the hidden gems that you'd like to say, if you come to Tofino, you have to go see this because it's off the beaten path or it's a little bit more recluse than the traditional provincial guides say. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you know that dep it depends. I, I you know I never give people advice unless I ask them a little bit about themselves, what they're interested in. You know, and uh, you know, if, if people come and say, "Oh, I'm here for two days," I usually say, "Well, how much money you got?" <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know, if money is not a problem, or if this is the only time you're ever going to make it to the west coast of Vancouver Island, get on a plane, get on a seaplane at the River Air. Just get down there, one of the seaplanes, uh, and you, in a clear day, just go up the coast. It is spectacular. I used to work up the uh, the coast in little communities all up and down the coast of Vancouver Island, and I got to fly. And every single day I was in a plane, I thought, wow, this is absolutely stunning. So, you know, if money's not an option or uh, if money is, uh, you know, concerned, but, hey, you're only going to be here once, you cannot miss getting on a plane. Uh there's also, I mean, we are, the peninsula's great. The beaches are great. It's a wonderful little community. You can pick any restaurant in Tofino. There is absolutely fabulous world-class food here. Uh, you know, you can't miss. And I would say try as many as you can. Just get out there. Um, so the restaurants are great. But we're we're in Clayquot Sound. Uh, you know, it is stunning. Get on a kayak. Get on a boat. And uh, depending on what you want, if you don't mind uh, getting blasted by waves and, and spray and getting on a loud Zodiac, get on a boat. You'll love it. If you like that quiet paddle and your shoulder strength is decent to uh, get a kayak, uh, you know, Tofino Sea kayaking down there, get a coffee, get a kayak and go visit Clayquot Sound. And I also, to be honest, I also send people to Yuclubit. They have got a fantastic trail, the Wild uh, wild Pacific Trail. It's very different than you, in Tofino. It's very rugged, rocky. The waves crash in, but it's totally worth it. And and get a bike. I mean, you could get on a bike. Do the multi-use path. I mean, it's it's spectacular. You could get on a bike in Tofino and end up in Yuclulet at the end of the day. And people that were not aware of the beauty of the West Coast, the ruggedness of the West Coast, it would blow their mind. You know what I mean? Like it, and it, and that's cheap. So there you go. So get on a plane, get on a boat, get on a bike. It seems like you just have to get, get on, on something, get on a kayak. Yeah. As well. 
but no, I'm going to make you absolutely. go ahead and go visit the restaurants and eat as much as you can possibly eat. I'm going to make you uh, do a little Sophie's <laughs> choice here for a second, Dan, if you don't mind, but where do you go okay. after a long day of council meetings, after a stressful day of being mayor and knowing that you're going to have to wake up tomorrow morning and do the exact same thing over again to make your community better. Is there a spot in the community that you can go and decompress at? <laughs> well, to be to be absolutely honest, if you were going to ask me what I actually do, uh, I uh, I, gen <laughs> I generally go home. I sit in my front yard and I start a fire, and, <laughs> I, fire. and I sit there and I watch the sunset and I sit, sit out there until dark until uh, and you know until I have to go in the house. Uh, you're not the first. You're not the last to say their house. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know we have a great brewery. I got to say, once in a while, I like to go sit at the brewery. It's usually filled with tons of locals. And even if I'm all alone, you know, uh, family's out or whatever, I can walk in there and, and walk out in two hours having some of the best conversations uh, ever. So, you know, it's a great okay. community. So my on that, my last question for you is we started by talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about Tofino. And I'm going to ask the million dollar question. I think all municipal leaders know how to answer. Just like to hear it from them for on the show a little bit um what makes tofino such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family oh wow wow well you know there's only one tofino uh it's uh it's unique to be honest i mean here's one little interesting stat is that we're we're the only municipality in all of canada with sandy pacific facing beaches we're it uh, we're on a peninsula. We're surrounded by water on three sides and a park on the fourth. Uh, it is a, it is a, it's just a beautiful community, you know, beautiful in, in, in the physicality, the wildness. It's also beautiful in, uh, in its makeup. Uh, the people that live here are, are generally want to be here and they care for each other. And when, you know, you really see that when, uh, when there's a tragedy, and there has been been many tragedies in Tofino. You know, people put aside their differences. They all come together and they just pour out their whatever they have to give, they give. And at the end of the day, everybody goes home and, and I'm sure they think, wow, you know, this is a real community and a real region. We're all, you know, all our communities together really are like that. And uh, at the end of the day, we're remote. And, uh, you know, when bad things happen, people come together and, and really reveal how much they do care for each other. Mayor Law, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and do this. It's a pleasure to speak with municipal leaders from across Canada. And it's always a pleasure to learn about our municipalities from the people who are serving them. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now wherever you're watching this or listening to this. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content and diverse interviews that we have coming up over the month of July and into August before our Season 7 return in September of 2024. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link in the Cross Border Interviews website or in the show notes below if you're watching this on YouTube. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.